Lunch spot is always the toughest spot uh, because everyone's had a good lunch and those eyes start to feel a little sleepy. But this is going to be such an impactful and dynamic conversation. It's like having a cup of coffee without the cup of coffee. Um, what we're going to be talking today is the growing humanitarian access challenge uh, in Ukraine. Um, you know, it's it, what's striking to me about this subject, um, we're at the fifth uh, anniversary, fifth year after the illegal annexation of Crimea and the military intervention uh, in Donbass. And this agenda item has been slipping, slipping, slipping on the top of the foreign policy agenda, not for the people that are the practitioners that are engaged in this issue every day, but it has really lost uh, its prioritization in our minds. And we're hoping this discussion tries to galvanize that and put it on a higher level on the humanitarian as well as foreign and security policy agenda. The figures of this crisis should actually demand that it remains at near the top of our agenda. A conflict that has taken 13,000 lives, has displaced over one and a half million people, that there are 2.7 million people living along the line of contact uh, in Donbass and Donetsk and Luhansk. In just the first three months of 2019, there were over 2,400 security, uh, uh, security incidents on or near the line of contact. If you just imagine, in 2018, there was a total of 1,500. So we've had a real intensification of, of uh, humanitarian access challenges, uh, uh, military attacks uh, around the line of contact. This is a very busy line of contact. There's over one million people that cross uh, between the government controlled areas and the non-government controlled areas um, up per month. We've seen very specific attacks on water and sanitation uh, facilities, which has created a, a very dire situation for clean and safe water. We've seen schools shelled, we've seen checkpoints uh, attacked. In fact, in just June, the Donetsk Marienka checkpoint was uh, attacked. The hardships on the pensioners that live and try to get access to diminishing uh, social benefits is extremely difficult. So we have a massive challenge. So that's the negative part of the story. But there are some some reasons for optimism. We have a new Ukrainian president, a new Ukrainian government that is focusing on this region. We recently had 70 prisoner exchanges between Russia and Ukraine, perhaps signaling some important movement. Um, we have just had an announcement by the uh, Ukrainian military that they may, they're contemplating a troop withdrawal along the line of contact, and they may be, uh, there may be some fixes to an incredibly important bridge uh, where uh, pensioners can get access and go to, b between the government and non-governmental controlled areas. And of course, we may have an upcoming Normandy uh, meeting between France, Germany, Russia, and Ukraine to perhaps put the humanitarian access issues at the forefront of this agenda. So some very challenging statistics and situation and some promise for hope. And we couldn't be m more well placed uh, for our panelists to help us understand the situation on, ground, on the ground in Ukraine as well as the policy imp implications of ensuring that there is sufficient humanitarian access in Donbass. So I'd like to, uh, we're not, I'm not going to introduce them in seating order, but I, this is going to be speaking order. We are absolutely delighted uh, to have Alexander Hugh with us. He was the former Principal Deputy Chief Monitor of the OSCE Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine from March 2014 to October 2018. Alexander was just in Ukraine last week, so uh, he's going to help give us the most current picture that we understand, and we certainly want to pull from his extraordinary uh, experience at the Special Monitoring Mission. I know I would often read reports that he would give and briefings. We all came to rely on Alexander's voice for so long and on these issues, and we're delighted he traveled uh, from Zurich to, to be with us uh, for this conversation. 
conversation. Alexander is no stranger to conflict situations, uh, in, certainly in Europe, having served uh, in the OSCE mission in Kosovo, as well as the EU rule of uh, law mission in, um, in Kosovo as well, uh, as well as uh, a role in OSCE in Bosnia-Herzegovina. So great deal of uh, experience there, and we're delighted that you are here. After Alexander speaks, we're going to turn to Melinda Herring, uh, the editor of the much acclaimed Atlantic Council's Ukraine Alert blog, which many of us also find in the must-read category. Melinda uh, has worked for many years prior to her work at the Atlantic Council, Eurasia Foundation, Freedom House, and the National Democratic Institute, where she is focused on managing a lot of democracy assistance programs in Georgia, Russia, and Azerbaijan, and we're delighted that Melinda will be here. Melinda's going to have to excuse herself a few minutes before we close at 2.30, so make sure your questions are, are directed early and often at Melinda, she's so uh, so knowledgeable of this particular issue. And the last but certainly not least, we have Margot Ellis, uh, who is the Senior Deputy Ad Assistant Administrator uh, in the Bureau of Europe and Eurasia at the U.S. Agency for International Development. Uh, we'd be here for quite a while if you'd have me explain her full resume. She uh, has been a, uh, a long-serving uh, Foreign Service officer, serving in many places, but really her, her last two assignments, I think, stand out uh, prior to this role. She was the Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator in the Bureau for Food Security, where she focused on uh, Feed the Future and, and other uh, cutting-edge AID global food security programs, but she also served for five years as Deputy Commissioner General for the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, which uh, is uh, a, a, a struggling um, uh, agency, unfortunately, today. But uh, we're really looking forward to uh, the AID perspective on the humanitarian access challenges uh, in Ukraine. So with that, thank you. We'll have a moderated conversation here, and then I really want to bring the audience into this conversation conversation and really uh, we're so privileged to have such a, a great group of, uh, of speakers. So with that, Alexander, thank you. Welcome for traveling so far and boy, we can't wait for your insights. So over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here and good afternoon. Um, with your permission, I've, I maybe just briefly give you the an idea of the dimension of the problem that we are trying to debate this afternoon here uh, so that the audience here might also uh, can imagine this a bit uh, more closer. The area affected uh, by the conflict are to the, to the very east of Ukraine, bordering the Azov Sea and the Russian Federation. These are two regions called the Donetsk region and the Luhansk region. They together uh, make up an area of 53,000 square kilometers, which is larger than my own country, Switzerland. Um, so that is the area that is directly affected by the fighting. In the more or less the middle of these two regions, there is now the contact line, as the agreements of Minsk refer to, which divides government-controlled areas where the Ukraine armed forces and the government institutions fully control their area from non-government-controlled areas where armed formations control some 17,000 to 20,000, depending on how you count square kilometers of that area. That includes two major cities of these two regions, the city, big city of Donetsk and the city of Luhansk and Donetsk. Uh, was a flourishing city before the war. Uh, my work in Ukraine started in early 2014, um, where it was still possible to fly commercially to Donetsk. It has a very famous football club, the Shakhtar Donetsk, <laughs> plays worldwide, not any longer in, in Donetsk uh, yet. Uh, during the European Football Championship, Donetsk hosted games in a newly built stadium, and it was also the industrial center of the country. Um, uh, now, the town itself, Donetsk City, uh, lies in non-government controlled areas, but bordering this contact line, this line dividing government controlled areas from non-government controlled areas, and large areas to the north and west of that city, quarters that were part of the city, make up that contact line, meaning anyone who lives there lives virtually now at that contact line. This line is some roughly 500 kilometer long, uh, incredibly long, 
contact line and direct translation, the front line, if you wish, uh, that's probably more accurate uh, of a description as to where the fighting does take place. It is a line that did not exist before the conflict. This is a artificial line drawn uh, back in September 2014 when one tried to find a solution to the problem. There is nothing natural there or historically that would divide the sites at this very line. It happened to be that this is the line at a certain point and where now the sites have been dug in and have their positions. All along that line, uh, there were, of course, previously uh, highways, railways, uh, even airports, and people crossed uh, these areas frequently, so it's infrastructure. So you have water pipelines, gas pipelines that cross that uh, uh, contact line now, which heavily had been affected by the continued fighting. Over that line, you only have uh, four, respectively five, crossing points um, uh, all along that 500 kilometer long line. All the other roads are blocked, um, mainly uh, through to uh, destroyed infrastructure, but also through minefields that stretch all along that 500 kilometer long line. But that doesn't stop people from crossing the line, and you've heard from Heather before, up to a million people cross that line um, in a month's time, 40,000 a day, um, that is uh, quite a lot of people considering it is a front line and you can go far and long to find a conflict where the front line as such is frequented so much by civilians, clearly indicating that this is not a group conflict that is driven by ethnic, religious or other differences. It is politically driven uh, and, and that is very important uh, to note as well. And I recall very much on both sides of the line asking people there what their views on this conflict is and what I heard um, uh, normally was it is not our conflict, they would say. We don't understand why it has started and why it is continuing and why it doesn't end. But the fact that the fighting continues so heavily along the line and the OEC special monitoring mission still reports up to 1,000, 1,000 ceasefire violations per day registered uh, by that mission um, now six years into the conflict uh, makes it very clear that uh, the fighting there is still a daily occurrence even though it doesn't make the headline any longer uh, in uh, areas outside Ukraine. It is very much of course a topic inside Ukraine and including with the new presidency now. Now that continued fighting has severe impact on the civilians and their lives, uh, their freedom of movement, obviously, now as I have just mentioned before, their lives and health directly affected by it. And you heard uh, staggering numbers before there, and I have just looked up what the uh, OEC and the UN has reported. So since the beginning of this year, uh, there were at least 130 civilian-related uh, casualties not counting competence, of course, civilian casualties uh, counted and, and verified along that, that contact line. Uh, it is very difficult uh, for civilians in these areas to go about having access to normal services that they used to have before, be it going to school, going to see a doctor, uh, going about every day's life, and that makes their lives uh, very difficult there. It is very important uh, just to conclude here to uh, note that humanitarian questions or problems in this conflict are often used as political currency uh, by the sides in trying to advance uh, their own side. A casualty among the civilian population often has been a convenient um, argument at the tables uh, in Vienna in the Permanent Council, or the Security Council in New York, uh, or then in the media, rather than an issue that should be solved directly. And often uh, one would speak not about the people directly affected in that conflict, but about entities involved uh, directly or indirectly, but very often uh, the civilians that are directly affected by it, are, but not directly involved in it, unlike in other conflicts, are often let aside. And I would like to leave it at that as per introduction, and I'm happy to answer any further questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexander. Great scene setting for us to dive into some questions. Melinda, please. 
Thank you. Thank you, Heather, for the invitation. And uh, it's an honor to be on a panel with Alexander. Uh, anytime we write about the Donbass, we always call him and get his opinion and make sure we know what we're talking about. So, And I also just, uh, you know, as a human, really respect uh, the time and years that you gave uh, to this conflict. So thank you. Uh, I am just back from Ukraine. I'm back from a trip finally to eastern Ukraine in, in June. I've, I've been really interested uh, in the conflict, but honestly, I have a small child and I didn't really want to go out to eastern Ukraine for a long time. So I finally did. The security situation was fine, and I was really surprised by what I saw. So I have uh, three big points and then one list of worries. I'm a worrier, so I've made a list of everything that we should be worrying about. Um, my, so my three big points are this. The politics are changing in Ukraine. Uh, we have a new president. And he ran on three different planks, and one of his planks was peace. And if you look at the polling, it's very clear that Ukrainians want peace. What that means is really, uh, you know, something that we're going to have to debate. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's actually technical because there's all kinds of details uh, about how you get peace in the Donbass. Uh, another obvious point to make is Zelensky's rhetoric has been very different on the conflict than his predecessor. And there, I don't want to make too much of a big deal out of this. Alex will tell me not to make too much of a big deal out of this, but there have been positive developments already in the Donbass. So the rickety bridge that we've all seen pictures of in Stancia Luhansk, it's this terrible bridge. Uh, it's the only uh, crossing in, in this oblast where all these elderly people have to go. It's finally being rebuilt, and there's now a camera. Actually, you can go on YouTube and watch them uh, fixing it. Uh, there's p potentially plans to open a second uh, crossing in Luhansk Oblast as well. There's a ceasefire in place, and I'm using quotes very liberally here. There's talk about uh, withdrawal of forces, and then we know that there's been a prisoner exchange. Uh, Zelensky has also said that he wants to figure out how to broadcast to people in the non-government controlled parts of Ukraine. I think that this is fantastic, and the U.S. government should get behind this initiative and figure out the technical aspects. There's a lot of technical aspects. What kind of equipment do they have? What stations can we operate on? There's some language sensitivities, but I think that this is a real opportunity. The, uh, Z I think Zelensky is, is right to say, uh, you're Ukrainian. We're not going to leave you behind. Uh, so let's take advantage of that opportunity and, and get behind the new government. Uh, there's also, so uh, everything is crazy. It, one very broad point, everything is crazy in Ukraine. I've been working on Ukraine for four and a half years. My Rolodex is almost obsolete. I, I felt like I had a good handle on Ukrainian affairs and I just basically need to throw it out because uh, most of the RADA members I knew, most of the ministers, uh, it, it's a new day in Ukraine. It feels very different. They're from a different part of the country. They have different instincts and we're all still trying to figure it out. Uh, if any analyst tells you that they understand the situation there, they're lying. Uh, the RADA itself is, is, is being called a crazy printer right now. There's so much legislation uh, going on right now, so I think that's important to bear in mind. Just from a, a bureaucratic perspective, uh, Zelensky wanted to save money and they reduced the number of ministries. So they took, uh, they've merged the uh, Ministry of uh, Veterans and the IDPs into one ministry. And there's concern now um, among NGOs and other people that the new ministry will throw out the plans and the work that's been done uh, on on Eastern Ukraine in the past. So uh, the civil society said, please, if you can make one point for us, it's important to use what's been done before and to appoint a deputy who really knows uh, the IDP issues. So uh, let me go to point two. I, I'm a journalist and I look for stories. And this is a conflict uh, that I think is really important, but no one writes about it anymore. Uh, and part of it, I'm gonna blame uh, my profession and, and writers as well, but um, Eastern Ukraine is portrayed as hopeless. There's long lines at the checkpoints. There's old people carrying enormous bags and it's intractable and no one knows a way out. That's basically the general storyline. You can't write that story over and over again, right? Like the, you've, we've written that story. Alex is right, there's 3.5 million people in need, there's 1.5 million IDPs. Most people are living along this contact line uh, that is the length of the, the French, uh, French and German border. Uh, but that's not the whole picture. And I, I wanted to challenge myself and tell uh, you know, other stories, not just these uh, stories of hopeless lines and queues and you know, the number of old people who are crossing. Yes, it's important, but that's not, we have to talk about the Donbass as a whole. There's a whole nother part of Ukraine that is changing. Uh, after 2014, there was massive depopulation on the Ukrainian side, and anyone with means left. So after the, after, uh, the Russians came, anyone, on the Ukrainian side basically moved to Kiev. 
Uh, but there's, so this is what I did on my reporting trip. There's real life in, in the Donbass. I have not been on the non-government controlled side. I'm not qualified to talk about that. I can only, you know, tell you what the statistics say. But on, on the Ukrainian side, people are rebuilding. Uh, things are changing slowly, and I think there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity for the West, there's an opportunity for development organizations, and I think there's an opportunity for storytellers and for think tanks uh, to, to be thinking about creative ways to, to, to say, actually, it's not, it's not what you think it is. So I'll give you some examples. Uh, and you might need a microscope to see these changes. I'm not. I'm not saying you know it's it's the top headline, uh, but people are starting to to uh, stop in crosswalks. People are starting to to look out for each other. The culture of restaurants is changing in uh, some of the towns there. Before the restaurants, uh, before 2014, uh, restaurants were used for business negotiations, and they were basically closed on the weekend. So now. Uh, families are actually having meals. And uh, the city of Kramatorsk built a fountain. Now I was there at midnight, and people are out talking to each other. And there's a sense that, that uh, it, in, the, in the Donbass for a long time, there was sort of a stereotype against talking to people and, having, and talking to strangers. And those things are starting to break down. And I think that we need to do a better job uh, of telling those stories. I think the bottom line is this. If we want Ukraine to succeed, enterprising people must come back to the Donbass. And, we, we need to be able to, I mean, part of it is to convince people on the non-government controlled side that they want to be part of Ukraine. Uh, so I, I scratched my head and talked to people who've been working on this a lot, you know, for years and years. And some of the ideas they came up with, uh, these are not my ideas, I'm, I'm crediting people in Ukraine, but uh, the, the U.S. government and uh, European governments should think about putting real money behind a university on the Ukrainian uh, side of the, of the border. There is no real excellent university in the Donbass now. It left. It, it, after 2014, uh, it's in Vinitsa now. There's a tractor university, there's technical universities, but there's nothing there. So let's put some real money. We know how to do this. The US government did this before. It helps, it helps start Kiev School of Economics. It started another university in Belarus. We've done this before. Let's open out the files at USAID and figure out how we did it and do it again. Another uh, uh, proposal is, is to put a military base on the Ukrainian side. Uh, there's been massive depopulation, and you need to get people back there. Um, I, I think it's important to study the best ideas that are happening throughout Ukraine, and I can talk about that more in question and answer, but there's some really brilliant civil society initiatives uh, to, to bring people from Western Ukraine to Eastern Ukraine and bridge those divides as well. And then I, I'm going to get flack on this, but I think that, that uh, we, we should talk about reopening the Kramatorsk airport. If the security situation uh, allows it, uh, the, the Donbass needs to be better linked to Ukraine. So I'm going to leave it at that, and uh, when we're ready, I have my list of worries ready for you, Heather. All right, well, let's get to this list of ways, Melinda. Thank you so much. It was great to get that perspective. Margot, a lot of questions about uh, the U.S. government, its role. We're so grateful that you could be with us and help share your insights. Great, and uh, I appreciate the comments that, that Alexander and Melinda made, and I hopefully build on them. I'll start with the, uh, the humanitarian situation and sort of then segue into some, some perspectives on where we're going from here. Um, the U.S. government has been committed to providing humanitarian relief um, and also then to bridge the divide um, from, or, or the, the journey from humanitarian assistance to stabilization and on to longer term development. I think um, we started talking about access issues, the, the difference between the government controlled areas and the non-government controlled areas. You, you heard the statistics. And I think we need to realize that access issues are the most consequential for those living in the non-government controlled areas. For us, for a, uh, an agency that funds um, initiatives, and we work on both sides, um, we don't have, and we meaning not just the U.S. government, but on USAID, but other um, international donors, we don't have full visibility of what's going on, on the non in the non-government controlled areas. But we can assume we're really relying, and it, the number of international NGOs is um, circumscribed, uh, dictated by the local authorities. I think there are two international NGOs that can work in Luhansk, three in Donetsk. But basically, we have to rely on local actors whose capacity are, is, is limited. However, in the government-controlled areas where we do have visibility, 
we've been working with NGOs and local organizations since 2014, and what we've seen is their capacity has significantly evolved, which is so critical for us for the transition from relief to development, um, and they have some significant capacity. Um, I think, Alexander, you mentioned about the elderly, and I thought I was reading about this, and uh, I didn't realize, I've seen a lot of elderly people on, on uh, crossings, but actually it's fully 20 percent, uh, uh, sorry, 30 percent of the population in need are elderly, and so that makes Ukraine's has the highest percentage of elderly affected by conflict of any country in the world. And so many of those people who are crossing of the 1.1 million crossings every month are, are elderly who have to cross uh, to get their pension and, and access other critical services. We have the U.S. government, USAID, uh, PRM, the State Department, has provided $210 million in relief assistance since 2014. And we've targeted the most vulnerable, who tend to live in the areas within five kilometers of the line of contact. The types of assistance that we provide, not unexpectedly, food, uh, access to clean water, help um, with repairs for damaged home, uh, help with uh, critical infrastructure repairs, emergency agriculture, uh, creation of safe spaces for children to play, uh, trying to prevent or respond to gender-based violence, uh, providing uh, counseling and psych psychosocial support for those who have been traumatized by years of exposure to war, and uh, for those most in need, cash assistance. And we also work with the uh, WASH and food security clusters um, and support production of, and security incident reporting to make sure that our humanitarian actors are as safe as they can be. We also have been advocating along with ICRC and a lot of other actors, and hopefully some of these messages are getting through. Number one, to avoid both intentional and unintentional damage to civilian infrastructure, whether we're talking about homes or cross or critical water or sewage or our energy power facilities. Because inevitably, uh, I think Alex mentioned that um, the um, these facilities Across the border. So an incident in the non-government control area is going to have an impact on the government controls area and vice versa. Also, uh, I think RC ICRC has been advocating the, uh, the creation of protected zones around uh, civilian infrastructure. Uh, the third thing is promoting the payment of pensions on both sides of the line of contact and to, for the government of Ukraine to de-link pension payments, which currently are linked to IDP registration status. So to, and then to also make available to non, uh, residents of the non-government controlled areas their uh, access to their official documentation and freedom of movement. So transitioning now, um, while the permission, uh, while uh, the non-government control areas tend to be non-permissive, we do have quite a few opportunities, as Melinda has suggested, uh, to offer resilience and development programs in, in the government controlled areas. So we are moving forward uh, for the last year, learning from our work on stabilization and humanitarian assistance programs. So the, um, the next few minutes I wanted to reflect on, uh, my comments will reflect on things that I've seen since traveling to eastern Ukraine since 2017, including most recently to the Sea of Azov region. Uh, it was mentioned, the Donbass was the Rust Belt and has historically been the Rust Belt of Ukraine. And these uh, polling has indicated that residents of the Donbass you know, we're separated psychologically, socially, uh, economically from the rest of uh, Ukraine. And they have been, historically, most skeptical of Western integration, EU reforms, et cetera. And unfortunately, I heard this earlier, oftentimes, just because of where the line was drawn, those residents of the non-government controlled areas were, were vilified and thought of as traitors or separatists, which is so ridiculous because it's, you know, it was not a, it's, this is a political decision and people just ended up where they ended up geographically. You know. and, and then in terms of the Sea of Azov region, which includes some parts of the Don, Donetsk, uh, including Mariupol, you know, it was the, um, the Kerch Strait incident last November was, um, upended the economy, but it really, the economy was already in decline, and so it further catalyzed that and accelerated that decline of traditional industries there, and it also cut off 
um, the Sea of Azov communities from uh, critical markets. Um, the other thing I noticed was this sense, uh, especially in the Sea of Azov region, because you have to travel three or four hours from closest airport to get there, is the sense of physical and also social isolation, as well as economic marginalization. So the challenge for us as a development agency is, in, in the areas that we can access, is to try to break the insularity of these oblasts and make people living there feel that, make them feel that they're part of Ukraine. So last year, in 2018, we started, we committed significant resources. We, uh, we created two new programs based on our experience working in the country and a lot of it on stabilization programs in the East. And the, uh, it's about $120 million in programming to two programs uh, entitled, one of is focuses on economic resilience, it's called Economic Resilience Activity, and the other is called Democratic Governance East. Now the Economic Resilience Activity focused exclusively on the East, is trying to promote uh, and more inclusive growth for Ukraine. And we are really targeting and creating programs that can create jobs for, for those most vulnerable, including IDPs and veterans. Our Democratic Governance East is trying to promote a unified civic orientation that of, of one Ukraine, but also encourage participatory governance um, in the local community so that people have a say in their future. So simply put, what we want to do is unify Ukraine. This is not, you know, it's not Eastern Ukraine, it's Ukraine. So most recently, as I mentioned, I traveled to the Sea of Azov region. One of the cities I visited was Mariupol. And it was very evident to me, and it's just, it's a case in point of what is possible and uh, what we can do. Now, for those of you who haven't traveled to Mariupol, it's a city of heavy industry, metallurgy, uh, it, it also did, did significant grain trade and had building material, uh, machine building, um, historically was the uh, generator of the economy. And um, what, if you look at the landscape now, it looks like, pictures of what Pittsburgh was back in the 1970s. Smokestacks, pollution-laden atmosphere. And what the cha so the challenge is how to move from this um, city to a post-industrial city that is governed by service-oriented, uh, more service-oriented economy, how do you capitalize on IT and small and medium enterprises. And what I saw there were, were some ingredients for the potential to make this transition, uh, the transition to for community revitalization. Number one, vi you vibrant small and medium enterprises. Um, the second was a very progressive city administration that was supportive of this transition. And the third element, I think you mentioned, Melinda, was the fact that universities, there are any number of universities there that, and together, these three elements, uh, the small and medium enterprises, the city administration, and the educational, can help incubate and create the right business in, uh, ecosystem for new, enter new small enterprises. So uh, I, the mayor there was, said, and had recognized the challenge, and he said he needs to transform Mariupol from a city of, this is his term, this is a city of metallurgists to a city of creative industries. And um, while there, uh, we launched a new IT cluster that we've been supporting. I visited an innovation center at a local university, which is trying to commercialize entrepreneurial ideas. And I'll just give you uh, two examples of things I saw. Uh, a young person had developed an app for restaurant concierge service that uses artificial intelligence. And another had created a material uh, that can be used to uh, renew, uh, it's actually a reusable material that can be used to clean up oil spills. Uh, so these are exciting new ideas that can be commercialized. Also, shortly to be open in Mariupol, this is a partnership between USAID 
and the city of Mariupol is a new administrative service center. And we've worked on these administrative service centers. I think there are 20 in, the, in eastern Ukraine right now. But this is going to be the largest. It will be uh, provide 400 government, different distinct government services. It could be a birth certificate, death certificate, access to pa a passport. You can register, get a driver's license there. These are the types of services that you can get. And uh, they anticipate when it opens, which will take place in October, um, 1,200 people will be using it every day. And importantly, 20% of them, of the uh, individuals who will uh, use the services will be coming from the non-government controlled areas. So it's also a very important bridge between the residents behind on one side of the uh, line of contact and the other side of the line of contact. Um, I reflect, I've just been talking about what I saw in Mariupol, but just reflecting on other cities that I'd visited between 2017 and 2018, I saw a significant change. And so whether I'm talking about residents who were in Kramatorsk or Slovyansk or Lysychansk, the, when I first visited in 2017, there was a, I sensed this tentativeness about their existence there. And I don't know where to go. And yet, when I came back a year later, I found that people had taken a sense, had a sense of ownership of their own future. They you know, maybe waited too long and realized that they've got to forge ahead with their lives. So in the past, um, where they, they had this fatalistic viewpoint, all of a sudden they were demanding more of their local governments. They were you know, asking for accountability. What is the local government doing for them and asking for services to be delivered? Also, youth, previously we were talking about moving to Lviv or Kiev or outside the country, all of a sudden they're looking locally to start up new enterprises. And I even visited a local museum who had created a, an exhibition to celebrate its pre-Soviet past. So what the message is, is there are huge opportunities that we have to build on. We have to revitalize the economy. We have to bring, uh, build on this civic identity, but not a, a civic identity of Eastern Ukraine, but a civic identity of one Ukraine. So the point of all this in our programming is to prove uh, to the people of, you, of the East, as well as to the rest of the world, that the East is an inalienable part of Ukraine. Thank you. Margaret, thank you so much. Fantastic uh, conversation. I, I'd like to start the questions. Alexander, I want to start with you because to me what is essential for the, for the you know, bridging the divide and getting more into the uh, developing the economic resilience, the, the civic responsiveness that is required, we've got to get the security situation under control. And it feels to me it is not. Uh, it feels very fragile. Um, so. In your mind, what, what created sort of this intensification in 2019 around, I mean, we've always had these uh, dramatic uptick in ceasefire uh, violations, but it seemed to me that there was an intensity uh, in 2019, certainly the first part, was that uh, sort of connected to the uh, upcoming, the, the presidential and then parliament elections? And then I really would welcome your thought uh, your, your thinking on this very yesterday's announcement from the Ukrainian government to say we're, we're going to withdraw uh, Ukrainian military from the line of contact, or I'm not entirely sure what that entails. I would welcome your thoughts on that. But let's, let's talk a little bit about the security situation and then we can unpack uh, many of the points that you've uh, raised. Yeah, uh, thank you. The, the security situation along that uh, almost 500 kilometer long line hasn't changed in essence. So for those not that familiar with the situation there, you have positions pitched against each other uh, at the smaller distance than from where I sit now to the door where you leave that room later uh, across the road. So that is as close as they are in some of the locations along that line. A recipe, of course, for constant exchanges of fighting. Uh, a swear word hurled across that line is enough to start an exchange of small arms fire that drags to the rear of the positions involves heavier guns and then uh, ensues in a long a battle that is very difficult to resolve. Uh, the positions are also very fortified. If you look at that line close up, you will find yourself in a First World War type situation with trenches uh, in different layers on both sides of the line, fortifications that run through towns, across infrastructure, or, or nearby buildings where civilians still live. 
uh, the small arms fight and, and the exchange is not that much of a concern because it, it, uh, the, the injuries and casualties among the civilian population result from the heavy weapons used. These are mortars, howitzers, larger calibers that produce a spray of shrapnel when they explode and these shrapnels they fly at a very high speed and go through walls like through butter. Uh, and these are the weapons that uh, cause most mayhem. And these are very mobile weapons. So the, for instance, the 82 millimeter mortar, those among you who have done military service know it's a very flexible mo mobile uh, piece of gun. It's approximately this height. You can easily carry it around, forth and back, wherever it is needed. So that means these weapons can very quickly be engaged to the line of contact and then very quickly be removed. Just read one of the reports of um, the mission I've previously worked with, the OEC Special Monitoring Mission. You see that these weapons are constantly seen in areas where the sites have agreed they should not be. So what they have done is, in back in 2014-15, agreed for each type of weapon as to which distance these weapons should be withdrawn. And, and, and in simple terms, again, this would mean at a distance where they can't be engaged. So a tank or that 82 millimeter mortar should, by agreement, be 15 kilometers away from that contact line. That means at that distance, uh, these two weapons, and the bigger the caliber, the further away it need to be, can't be used any longer. So what is also clear uh, and especially now in, in recent days where there has been a decline of reported uh, ceasefire violations is that there seems to be no issue in command and control. Um, there had been various recommitments to that ceasefire that had been agreed back in 2014 at the occasion of Christmas, New Year, uh, the beginning of the academic school year. And if you read reports uh, by the OEC mission, you will see that the ceasefire violations dropped from thousands the previous day overnight to almost zero the following day. So it is blatantly clear that there is a command and control structure. Uh, orders have been issued, and at least in these occasions they have been obeyed by. So there is a clear line of, of communication and, and order from the negotiation tables uh, wherever they take place down then to, to the front line. That also makes it very clear that this is a conflict of clear, uh, clearly driven by political will or unwillingness to stop it for whatever side you will, would look at it. And in order to change the, the military situation, the security situation, you would need to go back to the basics of what, what have been agreed. Disengagement of forces where they stand too close, uh, withdrawal of heavy weapons, out of engagement distance and start, in all earnest, uh, demining in areas. So if these three main security points would be implemented as agreed previously, you could eliminate uh, uh, many, if not all, of the incidents that still cause uh, havoc for lives and health of civilians, but also for the industry infrastructure they depend on. And interestingly enough, these uh, incidents are caused by those who claim to protect those that actually suffer from it. Thank you. Can I just, uh, one thread, uh, the sort of this idea of these protected zones around checkpoint, what, what, uh, how do you think that could be implemented or what would that look like if these protected zones around key areas, how would that work? One of the big problems in this and other conflict is that having positions or weaponry nearby uh, a hospital, a kindergarten, a water filtration station, not only um, uh, is used as a firing position, but it also becomes a target as, as soon as the gun is fired that stands next to the filtration station. And because the weapons used in this conflict are not precise weapons, they're indiscriminate weapons, so an artillery shell you can't pinpoint on a specific tank on the other side, it flies in an area and then explodes in a, in a certain area, but not pinpointed. Very old equipment often used in precise equipment uh, used. That means often these uh, installations then are at peril. So what, again, would need to be done is that these guns need to be withdrawn. Uh, because some of the weapons have an engagement distance of over 40 kilometers, a zone around a, a critical infrastructure alone without at the same time having the longer reach weapons artillery weapons being withdrawn further, it would not 
would not help, but certainly would give a clear signal if such protective zone would, would be agreed that the sites would take serious uh, their obligations also under humanitarian law will make it very clear that such positions should not be placed near these uh, infrastructures and that they should not become target uh, when opening fire from the opposite side. Thank you so much. Melinda, I wanted to turn uh, turn to you a little bit on the thinking about the, these checkpoints. I mean, some of the casualties that we're seeing and the, the deaths are because these checkpoints um, have become, there's such delay and you have uh, elderly that have medical emergencies, they can't get to the other side. Uh, so these checkpoints are becoming a, a real humanitarian issue. And, and we've also had the concern of, of the Russian Federation sending, you know, so-called white humanitarian cargoes across to, in some ways, resupply the separatists as well. What is your sense when you were there in June, or did you get a sense from speaking with, with folks on the ground, sort of the, the, the energy around these checkpoints and trying to make sure that humanitarian access can cross them more easily? So I have only been to one checkpoint, and I don't want to misrepresent my experience there. Um, I, I know that in the literature, a lot of uh, civil society and humanitarian organizations have complained about the long lines, um, the, the fact that so many people are elderly and have to stand in the heat uh, in the summer or in the, in the snow when it's cold, that there's not adequate access uh, to toilets, to medical uh, assistance if you need it, uh, and water as well. But uh, the infrastructure has been improved at the, the checkpoint that I was at. Uh, you could see that it was, it was, it was noticeably better. Uh, I'm glad that humanitarian organizations are watching this issue. Uh, if you look in the reports, they will measure the time it takes to get people across. If you ask the Ukrainian government, uh, how long does it take? Um, their excuse, and I, um, these guys will have to tell me what they think, they'll say, uh, you know, we're not the problem. We've, we've, um, we're, we're studying this. We want to get people through as fast as possible. Uh, but the other side is the one who really delays things. Uh, you know, and, and they'll sometimes intentionally um, leave people at the border uh, or leave, Sorry, I shouldn't say that word. At the at the checkpoint, uh, they'll intentionally leave people there overnight or for hours and hours, and and make the the the, the situation far worse. So it, it's it's something to to definitely watch. Um, I just hope that more uh, crossings are, are opened. Uh, you know, if the security situation uh, permits it. <clears throat> but I think it's important to explain too uh, why so many people are crossing. Right, uh, Margaret was talking about pensions, and this is one of the the big issues. So old people, I just want to make this point really explicitly: old people have to cross the border every 60 days to get their Ukrainian government pension. So that's why that's part of the reason why we see people uh, going back and forth so much. Uh, so some people, and you physically have to do it. And if you can't physically do it, a lot of these people are immovable, so they can't make that that trip themselves. Uh, and I think. I think you're absolutely right. This is a point that we've been pressing on for years. IDP registration needs to be delinked to pensions. Uh, and and uh, there was an attempt to do something on it, and I was told that that didn't fix the problem. Thank you so much. I'm going to come back to your list of worries, but first I want to go to, I, I haven't forgotten, I'm worrying about your worries. Um, Margo, um, Help us understand what the coordination looks like between the U.S. government and the European Union, uh, a huge humanitarian actor in Ukraine as well. Help us understand uh, that coordination mechanism, what's working, what's not working. And then I'm struck, and I may sort of ask this question to, to all three of you, I am particularly struck that this is a crisis of the elderly. Uh, we commonly think of humanitarian challenges of, of, of young people in camps and young mothers. This is a this is a crisis for the elderly. How does that change, or does that change, AID's thinking and approach, particularly on the humanitarian? Obviously, it's a challenge on the the developmental bridge. You're trying to bring young people back in, and but how is that a particular challenge for you? And I would love both uh, Alex and Melinda. Maybe you can help us also understand. This, this challenge very specifically because of the high concentration of the elderly populations uh, along the contact line. Yeah. It's not just with the European Union, but all humanitarian actors that we actively participate in the various humanitarian working groups that I'd mentioned, the WASH and food security clusters, among others. In terms of the elderly, I, th I think it makes it quite important that we focus um, I'd say across the Europe and Eurasia region, you have, um, unlike in Africa where you have a youth bulge, you have declining 
population in general, and in many of the countries in which you ha operate, you have net migration out of the country, especially among youth seeking opportunities, especially traveling from country non-EU countries toward EU countries. So it increases the dependency rate uh, because there are fewer young people supporting the elderly. And so from a development from a developmental point of view, that's why it's so important that we can incentivize young people to stay in Ukraine, stay in eastern Ukraine, to rebalance this dependency. Um, yeah, so, and as, uh, you know, one of the things I noticed, I don't know what the, the, uh, what the regulations are now, but there were restrictions on, on, the, on the, the, across the e entry exit checkpoints and what you could carry across. I mean, this, this is an arbitrary decision by the government of Ukraine. I don't know what it is now, but why is 10 kilometers more, sa sorry, 10 kilograms more sacred than 15 kilograms? But putting these arbitrary restrictions on what can be carried across, and oftentimes these are sort of humanitarian supplies. This is the life, people crossing from the non-government controlled areas to the government controlled Areas that that's their lifeline. So why put arbitrary restrictions on what can be carried across? I was interested in your many experiences in conflict areas. Has the the concentration of the elderly and the and the transition uh, across the contact line did that pose any unique challenges as you were in the uh, special monitoring mission, or, or just would welcome your your view on that? Yeah, uh, thank you. And it's absolutely true that the uh, description as the oldest conflict uh, um, on the globe, I think it is by age in yeah, terms of yeah. the affected part of the population is, is, is certainly true and it has a lot to do with the fact that the younger generation when the conflict started um, moved away, first believing that it will be quickly over, as many including myself believed in early 2014, uh, but then saw that it doesn't and then started to settle elsewhere and open business and are in many areas in Kiev and elsewhere quite successful. Often the elderly then stayed back home because they have seen crises before. Uh, they said they also they believed it will be over eventually, but maybe not as quickly as the youth would uh, think at the time. Uh, often they also had no means to leave. Uh, some have left and run out of means and then returned back um, because they simply had no choice. Others could have, but refused to leave because they said, this is where I was born, this is where I would uh, like to spend the rest of, of my life. Uh, some have stayed to protect the property of their younger uh, family members. They had apartments in town, etc., and they looked after them. Uh, many reasons why uh, the elderly stayed back and, and the continued this continued pattern uh, led to the result that is now there, that uh, now the composition of the people crossing the line is quite different than to what it was in the beginning. I just would like to add, uh, in terms of the dilemma that the elderly face, it's not just the very dangerous way across the line, it's the way itself. So if you take a, an, an, an elderly couple that lives in Antratsit, a lot of towns in, in uh, eastern Ukraine have names of stones because of the mining history. There's a town in the Luhansk region, far south, uh, and that couple needs to travel to uh, the government-controlled area. It would need first to take mm -hmm. a bus to close the contact line, uh, then a taxi to the contact line, then walk across the line, probably take then again a taxi or, or move towards the place of where they, all the administrative processes has to go through, likely need to overnight in that area. And the same way back, people I recall told us that uh, by the time they come back to Antratsit in this case, uh, a, a lot of what pension they have picked up has already been eaten up by the way uh, to get there. And, and uh, when it comes then to multiple crossings, because maybe medicine is needed or they need to visit relatives in addition to going to pick up the pension, then life becomes increasingly very difficult, which bears a risk that less people uh, will be willing to, to cross the area where less connections are being made across the, the contact line. And, and the connection across the line is probably the biggest hope uh, there is, that there is no group dynamic evolving. If you take the other end of the spectrum, a very young child who was five or six at the beginning of the conflict uh, in this town and is now six years down, 10, 12 years old, that kid 
cannot recall anything but war and, and, and conflict and will be the next generation uh, that will then be hopefully the future of the place, but soon that generation will not be able to recall of how it looked before. And that is another reason why all should be put into force to mobilize to ensure that at least the dialogue across the line and many points that have been raised here uh, to make sure that there is a connectivity between the two areas will be, will be maintained. Otherwise, there will be an altogether different problems if you have then real groups emerging on either side of the line that make then probably the fighting a smaller problem than the group dynamic that you have to uh, deal with. Fantastic. Melinda, I would welcome your thoughts on the, the sort of the elderly uh, demographic, but I'd also like to segue to sort of let's tease out really what is right now the greatest challenge uh, for humanitarian access in the uh, non-governmental controlled areas. Uh, we have so few uh, organizations, ICRC being one, others, but what it, what it, the one thing that could happen or could negotiators try to encourage just to make that access better? And I just welcome your thoughts on that and, and others can join in on that as well. I think Alexander covered the, the elderly issue really well. I think the, the, the other piece, though, is that they're extremely poor uh, and they don't have much voice. And I'm personally worried uh, that they don't have anyone in the RADA to be their champion. We have a, a new parliament, and I've been looking for someone uh, who, who may be from the Donbass or maybe from another region who really cares about this issue uh, to, to raise it over and over again. Uh, and I can't find anyone. I'm, so I'm going to keep looking. Um, I'm sure there's someone there, but in the last parliament, there were a couple of, of people who were personally from the Donbass uh, who cared about these issues and who continued to press on it. So let, let's, let's hope there is someone there or someone makes that their issue. Um, in terms of the worries, so <clears throat> uh, mines are a major issue. Uh, this is <clears throat> the third most affected country in the world after Afghanistan and Syria. Uh, Alex can tell you, Alexander can say more about this, about the technical part of it, but that's definitely a worry. Uh, the pension issue is is a huge worry, especially given how uh, old the the population is. We've covered that, uh, and there 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 are remedies. There's uh, legal remedies, and the, um, the the humanitarian community and the legal um, communities in Ukraine have uh, remedies, but they, there needs to be political will, frankly, to to fix that issue. Uh, the third worry I have is one that's another um, long-standing one. IDPs still can't vote in local elections. Uh, civil society is trying to press on this issue. They have a, a draft bill, uh, and they're working it, so let's hope that they, make, uh, they have some success. My fourth worry is water. Uh, and the, my civil society people in Kiev say that this is not getting enough, ish, uh, enough attention. So uh, I think Margaret said there's interdependence. Um, with water, it, it, they're using, they're relying on 70-year-old centralized water systems, and they've been broken and damaged by shooting. Uh, so that, that's an issue that, that definitely needs more attention as well. Uh, a fifth issue that I, I just learned about is something called NGCA children. So there's somewhere between 40,000 and 50,000 children who've been born on the non-government controlled side, and their births haven't been registered. So they're at risk of statelessness, and there's no administrative procedures for birth registration of these NGCAA children. So that's, there needs to be some kind of legal remedy there. Alexander, do you have any thoughts on sort of what, what would be the one thing to improve humanitarian access that could be done today uh, to demonstrate uh, you know, maybe it's water and sanitation. We know the contact line when shelling happens in a water pipe or a sanitation, you have to get access to the non-governmental controlled area to help fix it on the government controlled area. Any ideas or prioritization of how we could just do one, sometimes you, when the enormity of a problem, like what well, is this just one thing that I can do or push sides to do to show progress? What's that one thing? I can only repeat what I've uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, the only way to do this sustainably uh, is to withdraw these weapons, to disengage and start demining, as agreed. It's not something new. They have agreed already and signed this um, uh, and, and have committed public to it. Some of this has even translated into a, a resolution of the Security Council. So I think the basis is clearly there. The recipe is there. What is lacking is, is the political will. What is done at the moment is symptom treatment. So often these infrastructure projects are being implemented, uh, water pipelines are being repaired, only then 
the day after them to be destroyed again. Um, and then the destruction is not only uh, a catastrophe for those who depend on it, but it's then even worse used to blame each other further and to further fuel the conflict. Uh, so without actually making sustainable change in, in the security side, which requires political will, the, the humanitarian situation will not improve. In an area, the sites have agreed it should be an area without risk, and in, in Russian or Ukraine, it's a zone without risk, and it's arguably the most dangerous area now to live in Ukraine, uh, is along that uh, contact line, which should be a safe zone as per agreement. Yeah, if I could just make one comment, I would ex anticipate if things continue the way they do, the infrastructure breakdowns will only accelerate in the future. And the reason is, you mentioned aging infrastructure, but the fact is we haven't been able to do routine maintenance. So um, you know, whether we're talking about the breakdown of the water, or water filtration system just because of lack of routine maintenance, I'm not talking about the shelling or electrical uh, power lines being uh, non-functional, that could easily accelerate in the future. Uh, Margo, uh, this may, it's certainly out of perhaps AID's uh, remit, but how much does the U.S. give to demining, and, uh, and are there NGOs that can actually access to start demining because the security situation is so I restless? Know, I don't know the ex actual figure, um, but several billion dollars. It's, yeah. it's not through USAID, yeah, but I, I would imagine it's probably around $10 million. But. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm not privy to those, those numbers either, but sustainable demining only is possible, of course, once fighting stops. Often you could see demining preceding uh, humanitarian access mm -hmm. because that is needed only then for overnight these mines to be relayed again. So if we then want to access the same area the next day, demining would need to be uh, done again. Mm -hmm. uh, because the sites are too close from a military perspective, they need these mines to protect their flanks, etc. I just want to add one point on the infrastructure. Not only is the, the bad maintenance an issue, what is also probably coming a big risk are environmental risks associated with that. Uh, there is a lot of chemicals stored yeah. along that line. There is sewage that is stored. Uh, there are chemicals needed in water treatment plants um, that are in the middle of that high risk zone. And if these areas can't be maintained or accessed properly, also that is a potential risk uh, that could put into danger large parts of the population that lives in these areas too. Okay, that issue jumps up on my, my worry list now that I've started Melinda's uh, worry list. Before I turn to the audience, um, so we potentially, I'm not sure if there is a date set uh, yet, we may potentially have a meeting of the Normandy format uh, hosted uh, by President Macron, who has certainly been in communication with President Putin, and again, we've seen some positive dy dynamics politi politically with the prisoner exchange. Just you know, wild guessing, what would be the most positive outcome in a political dynamic that could impact this situation on the contact line? As you said, Alex, it's been in writing for five years. It's just the parties aren't implementing. I, I take that point. But is there one political outcome that we could see at this potential meeting um, that could help this? And, you know, just sort of wild, wild guessing a little bit. Melinda, I'll start with you. We can work with our panel way down. I thought I thought you were going to ask uh, Alex the really tough question. I, I, I thought you were going to ask him how, how do we uh, incentivize Vladimir Putin to end a politically driven conflict? No, 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 no. no. We're all ears, Alex. Um, honestly, I, I don't I, I don't know what to make of the Normandy Four Summit. I, I think that there's a lot of fears around it. Uh, I think that most people. Um, who who are watching this are afraid that Ukraine is going to be uh, pushed in a corner uh, and that there's huge pressure to compromise uh, and that um, Macron uh, has stuck his neck out. Uh, Merkel wants something and uh, e e and there's a lot of fear that the Ukrainians are unprepared and they don't know what they're doing and they don't know where their red lines are. So uh, frankly, I'm very worried. I think there is opportunity now, uh, indeed, that uh, um, with the current constellation that things can get moving again. Equally, there's a risk that it can get stalled to where it was before. It is an opportunity because the new president speaks about peace. Uh, president Macron speaks about peace. Um, uh, probably President Putin would like to be seen as the peacemaker. Um, and so all of that together 
uh, probably are ingredients where there is an opportunity, at least a theoretical one, uh, that uh, things can be resolved. But after five years or six years of conflict, this will not be easy. Uh, and it would require, um, if it is sustainably to be changed, and sustainable peace to be enacted, a lot more than just stopping the shooting. That is what I have outlined before. Not as difficult as it might appear, because it requires orders to be issued and those to be obeyed, and that the sites can do that. I have demonstrated in the past, uh, but there need to be difficult decisions to be made, uh, and, and they, need, they are not only difficult in, it, in themselves, also to sell to their constituencies. And, and that, I think, will be uh, the great challenge that um, such a meeting will bear. And the risk is, of course, that in such meetings that smaller issues will be discussed rather than the big items that nobody wants to talk about. It's easy to talk about the water plant, the bridge, a road that needs to be reconstructed, even at that very high level, rather than uh, the real big political questions of the involvement in that conflict and how uh, the, the sites, in multiple plural, uh, can resolve it. Uh, and getting stuck on these microscopic issues is a convenient way of not addressing the bigger picture, dragging the thing further, and that is a risk in that. I agree with Alex. Uh, I was just going to say uh, Ukrainian public opinion is uh, is very strong uh, and uh, it's going to constrain what the president is able to offer as well. So yes, there's international pressure, but then there's also pressure within Ukraine. Uh, and we saw in uh, 2015 when the Rada tried to uh, ratify part of Minsk II that people were throwing grenades and that uh, society, you know, has very strong feelings on these views. So, uh, you know, there's, I think we need to be realistic about what he can actually offer. Margo, I'm going to ask you a final, slightly different question. Um, bipartisan support in Congress for maintaining a very robust U.S. assistance program to Ukraine. Obviously, you're focusing on the key areas, but uh, we know we had a little bit of a question mark uh, that was more related to lethal assistance that was going to Ukraine. I, I take that point, but but strong bipartisan support in Congress, continuing very strongly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Good. You don't. No reversal scene. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Just double checking. All right. Uh, enough of me. Let's bring our audience in. Uh, we have colleagues with uh, microphones. If you, when you raise your hand, if you could please introduce yourself. We'll take, uh, colleagues, we'll take a couple of questions and uh, then we'll uh, turn back to our panel. All right. Front row here, Donna, please, sir, coming to you. And then we'll just take the colleague right behind. Yes, sir. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. Uh, one small correction. Birth records at both the hospitals and the churches are superb. Uh, so the lack of government records doesn't matter all that much. Eventually they'll be replaced. Um, the question is, there's been quite a bit of little successes of NGOs, particularly in Turkey, a little bit less so in Jordan, uh, droning stuff across the border to nearby villages. You know, particularly stuff that doesn't weigh a lot. Medicines in particular, very valuable. Documents even. And I think with that precedent, it might be possible to look at this for a major part of the perimeter of, of Donbass. Um, maybe clandestinely, but I even optimistically could say, maybe you could cut a deal with the rebels and the Russians to say, you know, this is clearly marked Red Cross drone. Uh, are you gonna shoot it down? Are you gonna let it go? Hi, my name is Mohammed. My question is, what are the political mindsets of Ukraine's bordering countries like Germany, France, and their response or role in alleviating the pain of the Ukrainian people? Question one more time, it's just a little hard for us to hear. Just, you have to really put your mouth in that microphone. Thank you. What are the political mindsets of Ukraine's bordering countries like France and Germany? and their role or response in alleviating the pain of the Ukrainian people? Bordering countries, I, I, would, I would actually, I'll, if I may, uh, add a little bit to that question. Really the role of Poland that has absorbed a lot of Ukrainian refugees. Uh, as we talk about sort of that one Ukraine and reorientation, I think Poland uh, plays a, a key role. Let me just pause there, and thank you so much. Technology, uh, thinking creatively, how we can use technology. The other question, though, 
uh, for Alexander for on drones. Have we seen where separatists, I mean, how have drones worked in the security situation, sort of both sides of the technology area? And then, of course, how to bordering countries, how are they helping to manage Poland, about Moldova? There's obviously some, some uh, ripple effect across borders. So who would like to start with those two questions? <laughs> you flew the longest. <laughs> Very quickly on the technology, the uh, um, special monitoring mission is using technology of long-range UAVs for its observation missions in areas where it has no access because it's too dangerous or they're not let into. Um, it loses also short-range UAVs um, in their patrol vehicles then to look behind walls and, and in areas where it has no access. It also has access to satellite imageries and has cameras, multiple cameras along that line. Uh, all of that equipment is also interfered with either electronically or kinetically uh, from the ground, uh, be it with small arms or then with surface-to-air missile systems that have been fired at the larger UAVs it uses. Um, despite the fact that they're clearly visible, they even have a transponder signal uh, on them that indicates it, what it is. And, and uh, by definition, again, on the agreement, it's only the OSCE who's allowed to. How many, how many drones has the OSCE lost over the last six years? Uh, I don't recall the exact numbers. So quite a few that had been uh, uh, shut down. Uh, a lot of it relates to electronic interference where the GPS systems are being affected by and then uh, the drone loses connection to the pilot and then uh, drops down. Uh, some of it has also been uh, shut down or attempted to shut down some of the um, of that imagery is also publicly available there. I, I do think that the, the smaller deliveries of help as suggested um, uh, it's already happening, and I know for a fact that a lot of families engage in helping across the contact, and not by using technology, but by deliveries they bring themselves across the contact line, uh, where there is no marking on the 75 kilos, so that I think is, is or, uh, the kilos that are allowed to bring across uh, the line indicated. So there is a system where people help people uh, along the line, uh, but the technology part, I think, would not work because it's simply too crowded in terms of, of weaponry and electronic warfare at, in these areas that flying these things, they would, would, would not work. And it would also probably put in danger the pilot of, of these UAVs, they, depending on the model, would be likely very close or identifiable. And that location would also be probably become a target then um, by, by the other side, assuming that what they see uh, in the sky is a is an uh, explorative um, trip by the other side rather than a delivery of humanitarian aid. Any thoughts on the border, uh, bordering states and roles that they can play or have not played? I think there is, is a lot of unknown there. Um, officially, there is the figure that you have mentioned before of one and a half million internally displaced persons within Ukraine. That figure is likely much higher even within and the refugees that have left Ukraine and now sought refuge abroad, including in Russia, uh, is, is probably as, as equal high, if not higher, uh, than that number. And I think the absorption capacity uh, within Ukraine uh, and outside Ukraine has not caused much of, of an issue as far as I can tell, but it's a question of time as well until the recipient communities of these IDPs or refugees have not any longer the means to accommodate them, and then that might lead to further troubles there. Marco, Melinda, do you have any reflections on those two questions? Okay, you're going to make Alexander do the work. All right, sir, we have a question back there, and then we can take the question over there. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. And Diana, we have a question over here, please, or Donna, whichever's got the microphone. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Julia Reinitz, Department of Labor. I wanted to follow up on the issue of birth registration and ask um, 
if there's any information about how this impacts access to government services, education, um, issues like that, uh, and whether there are any numbers on uh, the number of people who might be affected by access or have reduced access to government services as a result of birth registration challenges. Thank you. And I saw one more question back there, and then we'll return to our panelists. Thank you. Hello. Hi, I'm Kate Bunting. I'm the uh, head of HelpAge International's office here in uh, Washington. And we've been working along the line of conflict for the last uh, four or five years. Um, so a couple, I guess, one point of clarification and one question. Um, I guess my question sort of surrounds, um, it's great to see the support in Congress and certainly um, USAID can be credited with recognizing pretty early on the nature of the conflict being different and, and sort of applying some different strategies. Um, so I thank you for that. Um, my question surrounds um, the support that's going in there. I know that uh, the OFTA support is starting to uh, be uh, decreased and trying to put more transition funding in there. Um, but my curiosity is, is around the line of conflict, as I understand it, a lot of the funding is now going into the NGCA instead of staying you know, in, in the GCA and the line of conflict. My comment is just um, as we recognize how many elderly are, are in Ukraine and in that area, I don't want us to portray that they're all completely helpless. Um, I was there in 2015 and it was the older people themselves that were really solving these problems for themselves. They were the ones devising systems, going back and forth, figuring out the answers to pensions. Um, and so I would urge that as we go into uh, transition program that we don't think it's all going to just be solved by younger people and that we leave the older people who live there out of the solutions. Wonderful questions. Thank you so much. Melinda, I'm going to start with you because I'm mindful you may have to sneak away here. So we have really it's describing the health situation both as the crisis began unfolding now six years later. Uh, speaking a little bit about birth registration, uh, understanding that, and then of course any comments or reflections on increase in assistance to the NGCA. Uh, thank you for the last comment. I think that that's really important. We wrote a paper in, in 2017 uh, and we tried to destigmatize IDPs and try to talk about the ways that they were contributing to Ukraine um, because many people have uh, you know negative stereotypes about them? Uh, the different organizations they're starting, the different uh, ways that they're they're giving back and contributing. So if you get a chance, I, I recommend that report. I, I take the point and, and thank you. Um, on the NGCA children, uh, I just got this information. We're developing it into an article. So uh, check Ukraine Alert in about two weeks for more details. The number I have is between uh, forty thousand and fifty thousand children. I, I have really good uh, people in Kiev who are putting this together, though. And on health, uh, I, I, we, we can certainly do an article on it. I don't have the number, uh, the information, my, my fingers. Alexander, do you have any comments on both the, your observations from the health system and maybe sort of increased assistance to the NGCA? What are the implications and challenges there? Uh, thank you. Uh, again, I, as uh, with Melinda, I don't have the numbers of the situation uh, in terms of health on both sides of the line, it's also difficult to combine. Uh, in general terms, certainly, is that as more specific your illness gets and the medication you need, the more difficult it is to get access to that medication. Um, I also believe, as in any other conflict, um, that you can get access to the medication if you have the money for it. Um, uh, that 500 kilometer long contact line is probably also a, an area where a lot of goods go both ways. Illicit goods go both ways because there is demands for such specialized goods on either side of the line. Um, and I'm sure this also applies to medical equipment. Uh, but again, the more specific your need is, is be it uh, the equipment to, for the blood dialysis, for instance, that is something very specific, very neat, replacement items for the machinery to clean your blood, and that is hard to come by. That certainly is, for instance, an example where I'm sure that there are difficulties. Whereas hospitals run 
in areas not controlled by the government. Uh, so it's not that you have no health service in these areas. So there is some that is available there, but I'm sure that the more specific it gets, the more troublesome it is. Uh, whereas data on the government control code side is clearly available uh, and their access um, for most part of the population, government controlled areas is, is, is possible. Uh, the closer you get there to the line, it might be also difficult for the first part of your journey to the first service provider, but from then on, it shouldn't be a big issue. Something on uh, the health situation. Um, I mean, we've been working on health care reform in general instead and to move from the past system where pharmaceuticals were really out of reach uh, because of the cost to bring down and being successfully trying to get the private sector involved in bringing down the, the cost of pharmaceuticals, but also moving from flat amounts that are accorded to specific health care facilities to basically the patient uh, more the patient, uh, patient service, the reimbursement to hospitals and healthcare facilities is based on the patients and the services that they provide services to. I know we're working in the government controlled areas on healthcare reform and it has improved the service delivery there. I really can't speak to the non government controlled areas. But. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me, we have a little more time to go back around. I have one final question if our audience is been drained. Okay, one last question to uh, to Alexander and, and to uh, Margot. I was I was struck. Um, uh, the U.S. ambassador to the OSC mission, Ambassador Gilmore, just gave a very powerful speech at the Human Dimension uh, meeting, uh, and had demanded uh, OSCE special monitoring access to Crimea. Alexander, your thoughts on uh, increasing uh, special monitoring missions' role potentially and gaining greater humanitarian access to Crimea. A sticky last final question, but you've been an excellent panelist, so I thought I'd ask you a tough one. And Margo, welcome into your thoughts as well. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm not representing the OEC uh, today, um, but having read the uh, mandate of the Special Monitoring Mission, which is a publicly available document, it's a two-pager, I recommend it uh, to be read, not least because it has been drafted before the conflict has actually started because the SMM doesn't stand for Special Minsk Mission, it's a Special Monitoring Mission after all. But it happened uh, on the 21st of March 2014, which happened after uh, the occupation of Crimea. And if you read the document, you will not see a reference to Crimea, but also not an exclusion of it. So this is what uh, diplomats do in order to avoid uh, to answer the question, so it is not excluded and not included. If you read further in the document, you see interpretive statements by participating states where the Russian Federation says explicitly in its interpretation it is not included, and I think all the other uh, 56 uh, would see it uh, slightly different. Um, I'm sure that the OEC would consider if there is consensus, but as you know, the OEC would need to decide that in, in a consensus a vote, as for any other decisions it would, uh, it would take in that regard. Uh, if I may add, the, there is monitoring um, at the administrative boundary line between uh, Ukraine and the peninsula happening by the Special Monitoring Mission and the UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission actually issues uh, publicly available uh, reports on its distant monitoring by interviewing people uh, from uh, Crimea that uh, gives some uh, light as to what is happening uh, in Crimea. So it's not totally black there. Uh, there is available information as to what's happening at the boundary line or actually inside, in this case, by the UN. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And uh, those reports, whether it's the SMM, I mean, they've been incredibly valuable for both understanding what's going on on the ground and for research purposes. Uh, so we thank you. Thank you so much for traveling so far and sharing your extraordinary uh, insights and for your service. Uh, we can't tell you how, uh, how grateful we are, and we're sure you will be called into service in the future. Unfortunately, there are many challenges like this. And Margo, thank you so much both for your service and your work on this very important area. We're very very grateful that you took time out of your busy schedule to be with us. And uh, although Melinda had to race out, we thank her for her insights. Uh, colleagues, please join me in thanking our panelists for a great discussion. 
and you may be able to take a sprint out to have a quick be the first of the coffee urn for a coffee break before uh, your next session. Thank you all again. Thank you.